stand and let Jesus shine in this place today. Good morning, everyone. It's so great. Look, the house is pretty full. This is great. And can't wait for fall. Have you seen the weather forecast? Yeah. It's supposed to be snowing by Wednesday. This, this is Missouri. Anything's possible. You know, if you, if you want to, then maybe that's why the church is so crowded. Everyone wants to go to heaven because they've had a taste of hell the last week. Man, you walk out the door and he just hits you and there's no breeze and uh, we, we installed a wheel, big wheelchair ramp Saturday and it was kind of nice. We had a north wind and it wasn't near as hot. Oh, that was nice. I have this for you and see what you think about it. When people lose their why, they lose their way. So think about why you're here today. Why? Why are you here? Well, we're here to worship God. And so, therefore, we probably won't lose our way. But I have seen it so often. When they lose the reason for doing something, they lose a lot. Here we go again. When people lose their why, they lose their way. Well, have a seat, guys, and thank you so much for being with us today at Christ Community. Hey, a judo. We do a judo ministry here. It's, uh, classes are all free. We have classes from five years up. We have two kids' classes. This is Tuesday now, mind you. We're starting back after our summer break. And uh, we teach, we, we, we specify on, uh, the, our teaching on more self-defense, but it is uh, the art of judo. And uh, for kids, there's, uh, we teach discipline and respect. We have devotions before every class. And so we have large kids' classes. We showed a video a couple of weeks ago. Um, but come and be with us, and then we have the teen and adult. Now, we call it teen, but we start at 11, because that's when they start middle school. So 11 years up to adults, we have a lot of people that take it to learn self-defense. And in the adult judo, we do, in judo, we have strikes and kicks and that sort of thing, but we, we aim towards self-defense. And we have some men take it, several women that take it, and then a lot of teenagers take it, and especially girls. Now, when my girls were growing up, I taught them um, the nastier side of self-defense. Because, uh, you know, they head into dating, and yeah, those, those boys, they were crying by the time they got back at 11 o'clock. And some of them had black eyes and bloody noses. But anyway, um, if you want to come to judo, uh, come. If you want, want more information, send me a message. 
And that's starting this Tuesday. All right. We also are starting with Paul's Kitchen and Community Classes September 20th. So it's coming up in just three weeks. Um, and we have lots and lots of adult classes. We have kids' classes, youth classes. The meal is between 5 and 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. And we have buffet tables, salad bar tables, you know, with the ice in them and everything. We have drinks and, and ice, uh, soft serve ice cream, sometimes dessert. And it's all for a low price $6 for adult, three something at, for kids. And college students, I think, or, you know, anyone in that age group is like $2 if you want to do that. So anyway, we, we do this, and then at 6 o'clock we have all our classes. And I have some folks from Paul's Kitchen here to talk to you. And they're as angry as wet hens. So you better sign, you better sign up. Kitchen look fun. <laughs> um, I'm Stacy Moss. I run Pop Kitchen, and we are looking for volunteers. But I wanted to say September 20th is right around the corner, and we are super duper excited to start. Super duper excited. To super start. duper. <laughs> um, and we are going to be outside after this. If you want to talk to us, so. Where you can help, what was that thing about the why and the way? Mm -hmm. Well, the why is you can serve God and you can help me. <laughs> and that is how... I totally lost it. I did fine the last three times. So. Well, it's a bigger crowd. It makes, it it makes, it makes you more nervous. I was trying to be cute. It didn't work. So, anyways... So, but we have youth that help with the tables and the chairs, but what we found out is that they were missing some of the class. So if you don't have a class that you're going to on Wednesday, then I would totally need your help with the tables and chairs so that youth can still get their ministry. And the more volunteers we have, the sooner we can get out. So you would be able to eat here, eat for free with Paul's Kitchen, and then we usually are out by like 7 o'clock, so we start getting the dishes and the cups and everything at 5.30, and then hopefully out by 7. So I appreciate any assistance, and we'll have a sign up at the back. So just look for us. Thank you. And I'll stop being cute now. Um, yeah, the uh, Paul's Kitchen, we, we need uh, dishwashers. People do tables and chairs. The youth help, but last year... We, towards the end, we started losing a lot of our help because they just got busy doing other things, and the youth were doing it too much. And so now we want to, they were going to start a little before six, putting up tables and chairs, but we want them to go to class. And so we're looking for people to help with that, also scrubbing pots and pans and such, even if you want to do it for a semester um, and then join a class the second semester. But uh, anyway, you're signing up for about 12 weeks each time. So anyway, they will be in the foyer. Go by and sign up with them. We had with some from Saturday night. I don't know if I didn't talk to you for early service, but great. And so, guys, it's, it's important. Sometimes you serve um, and sometimes you, you uh, learn. But uh, take some time to serve every once in a while, too. Okay. Barry? Good morning, my name is Barry Sanborn and I'm the Connections Coordinator here at Christ Community. Two announcements today. First of all, we have a business and service directory that we're preparing new for the fall. If you are a business leader or you have a service you provide, a handyman service or something else, we would like to put your name and your business or service in this directory. 
So if you'd like to be added, simply grab a form. The table's on the, in the foyer. Fill out that form and turn it in either to me or the main office by next Sunday, and we will get you in there. We also have many people asking, where could I find someone who does this at Christ Community, who has this particular business or service? Those are in those printed directories, which we will have new again here in a few weeks and online as well. Lots of great businesses and services here. We want to add you to that if you are a person who has something like that. Our second announcement is about a ministry called Aspen Roots. And as you can see on the screen, this is a ministry for people ages 18 through 25, post high school, that has several options. Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings with Pastor Ty, and Wednesday evenings with Pa's Kitchen. There are three options. There's also uh, more coming. You might have noticed students by the street today holding up signs saying, glad you're here. That were, was members of the Aspen Roots group. Those students also went to Crowder College this week and talked to people about this new, exciting, and growing ministry. One other part of it coming up will be a coffee shop open Mondays and Thursdays here. You can come do homework, study, read in the comforts of the inside, free Wi-Fi and other great things as a hangout uh, for students. Katie Clark is the person to talk to for more info. So we have a very active 18 through 25 year old group that is growing. If you have someone in that age group that you would like to see involved that maybe doesn't attend any church, please give us their name and contact info and we will reach out to them and let them know about the exciting things happening in Aspen Roots at Christ Community. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Well, our youth group continues to grow as well. Logan's doing an amazing job with all of our middle school and high schoolers. And she came to me and then later to the SBR saying, I need help um, for the different classes. You know, it's, it's, you can only be one person at one time. And so we uh, have hired a, someone to be her assistant. It's part-time, uh, but Johnny Lindsay. Johnny, stand up. I've known Johnny, I don't have many years, long time, and he's been working as a counselor with the youth group, and uh, we were looking at, at this, and he comes up and just says, hey, I'll do it. He already, he owns a business, a very big business, and he says, you know, it's God's business. God take care of it if I have to be away a little bit, and so uh, he, he's going to jump in, and he just loves, he loves throwing water balloons at kids is what I heard. <laughs> is that true? Yes, okay, see, all right. And so he'll be here for youth, he'll, he'll run, I think is the middle school group, Sunday school class and everything, so anyway, fantastic time. All right, well I want to invite the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings this day. I do want to say that if you are visiting with us for the very first time, thank you for being here, I appreciate it, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the service, but take the offering basket and pass it on down. For the rest of us who have said we are going to be in ministry here, this is our base of operation as a, as a Christian, that we are called upon to give. Father, as we give to you this day um, our tithes and our offerings, I pray that you might take this, increase it, and turn around and make sure it, it blesses so many people and that it builds the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thanks, Abby. Abby, are you 12 now? Is that your age? 13? I don't know. 12? I've known her since she was an infant. And now that we found a uh, pianist, um, Ken, we can let you go. See you later. Well, guys, um, I'm not preaching today. Uh, Ty is preaching this service today, and like someone said on Saturday, well, you've been preaching for a while, and you know, you needed a break, and I did. But also, guys, we have uh, three very good pulpit preachers in your church, and uh, Ty is, is, uh, is going to bring you a great message today, and I think it's important every once in a while to change out so you get a different perspective. I have a certain perspective on the gospel. He has another, and every preacher and every person has kind of a little different perspective or things that they like um, as, they, as they preach and share. And so uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to have him. I've heard him on Saturday night and Sunday early service, so you guys get to hear him here in just a little bit. Bob's going to pray for us today. Here's some prayer concerns that we know of anyway. Uh, Bob Gray, who attends early service, and uh, he... Uh, is home from the hospital finally he is very weak but they they're praying that the numbers are all coming up so uh, we're praying that he gets stronger mary blumenhorst he usually she usually attends this service she is finally out of the hospital every day they thought she was getting out they'd keep her one more day they were trying to uh, work on some things anyway she is home also gavin thurston i don't believe they're here today okay um, anyway, he you know, one of the children in our church and uh, went to Chicago for the surgery. Well, they're back now, uh, but be in prayer for him. It's a kind of a painful ordeal. Uh, Bob? Father, we do praise you. We thank you that you have invited us together in your name. You've invited us, God, to come into your presence to bring our thanks and our, our praise, our worship before you. We thank you, Father. And by your invitation, you call upon us to cast our care upon you because you care for us. Knowing that you care for us, Father, it does give us great confidence. Knowing, knowing that as we call upon you, that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And knowing that you hear us, God, it just excites me that you will move heaven and earth to answer our prayers. I thank you, God, for that this day. And Lord, this morning we pray for Bob Gray. Lord, we uh, pray that his strength would be renewed. We pray, God, that his energy would be restored. I pray, God, that his rest would be uh, beneficial. I just ask you, God, to show him your goodness and your mercy. We pray, God, for Mary this morning. I pray, God, for her uh, recovery. I pray that it would be sound. I pray that it would be complete. I pray that uh, she too would be strengthened, that her energy would be restored, that she'd be well and up and about and doing the things that she wants and needs to do. And God, we pray for Gavin this morning. I pray, God, for this young man. I pray, Father, that your hand would continue to be upon him. I pray, Lord, that uh, he'd be continually blessed I pray that you'd protect him, that you'd shield him. I pray, God, that you would uh, raise him up to be a young man of God. I pray for his family, Lord, that you would watch over them and help them as they, as they stand by, Gavin. Now, Father, we do praise you that you called us into this place to worship you and to praise you. I thank you, Father, for the praise team, for uh, your, your hand upon them. I pray, God, that you continually anoint them that they might anoint us to worship you. 
And I thank you, Father, for the good word that you've brought to us this day. I pray, God, your anointing on time. I thank you, Father, for the uh, skills and the abilities that you've given him, that your church might be edified and blessed and uplifted. And I pray, God, that if... Uh, I pray that this word would indeed uh, help and encourage those who might be uh, in doubt this morning. Help them to see that Jesus is indeed real and with them. Now, Father, we praise you for your hand being upon our nation, for healing this land. I give you thanks, God, for your goodness now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to share something with you guys. I don't have the microphone, but I think you can hear me okay. Every day, Bob and I pick up our two first graders, Whitten and Molina, from school. And the other day, we decided we'd just drive around West Pitton for a little while. And we went by a park where there used to be a swimming pool. Did any of you remember where there used to be a swimming pool in West Pitton? Nope. Well, Bob used to go swimming there when he was a little boy. It's no longer swimming pool. But anyway,
song I'm praising my Savior praise your name, to worship you. Thank you for meeting us in this place, Lord. Thank you for sending your messenger. May he speak boldly and with authority, Lord, and may we hear and may we receive. In your awesome, precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So when I, um, when I prepare a message, I usually do it two or three weeks in advance. And when I did, I didn't realize that all of this nonsense was going to be in the news again, but here we are. Uh, I, I was thinking a couple of weeks ago just about some of the things that this church did when the whole world was shut down for COVID, and some of the incredible ways that the staff here kept the church alive and relevant in people's lives and connected. Uh, the, the youth ministers and the children's ministry, they did some pretty incredible things to keep the kids connected to the church, and it was amazing to watch. Uh, the people that are sitting up in the sound booth right now, they, they moved heaven and earth to make sure that we only missed one week of being together so that we could be out on the parking lot. They did some incredible things. You know, it was just amazing to see the way everybody came together and was coming up with all of these really creative ways to do things. And then there was me. They did all of these incredible things. I made goofy YouTube videos. And uh, it took the internet by storm. They had fives and tens of views. Uh, <laughs> I actually got an email from YouTube the other day. Are you still using this account because nobody's watching it anymore? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but no, that's, that's what I did. I made these goofy YouTube videos and I'd come up here at night and I'd film the videos at night to add to the ambiance of the whole thing. And there was one night I was up here and I don't remember, I was asking my wife if she can remember some of the details, but uh, neither one of us could really come up with them. I was up here, I'd finished the, uh, recording the video, and I had to go home real quick. We just live right next door. And I ran home real quick and took care of something. I told her, I got to go back up to church because I left some lights on and all the, all the equipment's still out. So I'm going to go up and make sure everything's put away, lights are off, doors are locked. And just about any time I do something like that, any time I leave the house, my oldest daughter, Abby, usually goes with me. Uh, she is my sidekick, and we just... Anytime I go somewhere, she goes with me. So she came up here with me. She was helping put things away. And just about the time we got done, I got a phone call, and it was my wife. She had stayed home with the other two kids. They were out in the yard catching lightning bugs and things like that. And she told them, okay, it's time to go inside, take a bath, get ready for bed, things like that. And when she got inside, she realized that our youngest, who at the time was four, had disappeared. And she calls me and she said, do you have Callie with you? I'm like, no. And right about that time, it was dark, we had the lights off. Uh, Abby, the one that was up here with me, she goes, Dad? And points to the door down here. Uh, yeah, and, and we do have people, we have people that are kind of milling around the property at night. We have our catalytic converters get stolen, things like that. I mean, it's Joplin. But, uh, so I, you know, I'm on the phone, our four-year-old's disappeared, and Abby sees somebody outside, so I go and look, and sure enough, there is a little leprechaun-sized figure standing at the side door, knocking on the door and waving, and like, oh, it, don't worry, Aaron, I got her. <laughs> she had walked up here at 10 o'clock at night in the dark. I don't know if you guys have driven through this back driveway behind the church. It's scary at night. 
Like, it's dark, and this was before we had the spotlights put in. Chris and I asked the trustees a couple of years ago, can you put some lights back there because it's so dark we can't see where we're going and we're afraid we're going to step off the road and break our ankle. So it was, you, can't, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and she walked up here in the dark, and when I opened the door and brought her in, I tried to very calmly explain to her, Callie, you can't do that. You can't just walk off and do what you want because it's dangerous. Okay. And then I said, weren't you scared walking up here? She goes, no. Uh, what do you mean you weren't? I'm scared walking up here. And she goes, no, I wasn't scared because Jesus is with me and monsters aren't real. Yeah. Chris said, that'll preach. We'll see. <laughs> You know, that's a, that, I thought, I remember thinking when she said that, you know, I was very proud of her for saying that, but I thought that is a pretty profound thing to come up with as a kid. And I'm not saying that because I think Aaron and I do an excellent job as parents. Uh, we don't. Abby, your thoughts. Actually, never mind. Don't answer that. But that was a pretty profound thing for a little kid, for a four-year-old to come up with. Jesus has a story that is very similar. In Matthew 16, you know, anytime Jesus would go someplace and, and preach and perform miracles, he always had huge crowds of people that were with him. In Matthew 16, he is, he's kind of retreated from the crowds, and he's with his disciples, and he, he asks them, he says, who do, who do these people in the crowds, who do they say that I am? And they come up with all sorts of different answers. They say you're John the Baptist. They say you're Elijah. They say you're a prophet. They say you're this, that, or the other. And then Jesus asks them a question. And I imagine when I read this that he looked right at Peter, looked him right in the eye because he knew that Peter was going to be the one that answered. Because Peter's always the one that answers. And he asked him a question that he forces every person that has ever lived to answer for themselves. He looks right at Peter and he says, who do you say that I am? You know, that's something that every one of us is confronted with probably several times in our lives. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and he said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He says, Peter, that is the right answer. Peter recognized who he was. He says, you're the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed prince. You're who we've been waiting for, for all of time. And he says, that's right. That is exactly right. And the only way you can know that is because God has revealed it to you. Not because you have read a bunch of books and you have done a bunch of things to try to bring yourself to that knowledge. You can't come to that conclusion on your own. Only God can show it to you. And if you know Jesus the way that Peter knew Jesus or the way that Callie knows Jesus, then you know exactly who he is. And it will change your life. God reveals himself to us in a lot of different ways. He reveals himself to different people in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways he does that is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Peter was very lucky to be right there and to see with his own eyes and hear with his own ears the things that Jesus did and said. God reveals himself to people through creation. Through, through the, the world, world that we live in. And when I say that, I don't mean that God reveals himself because when you walk outside in the spring, the birds are singing and the flowers are blooming and everything's pretty. That's part of it. But that's not how God reveals himself to us in creation. The world that we live in is so finely tuned that if anything was off by the smallest fraction, none of us would be here. None of this would exist if anything was off by such a small fraction that it's mathematically impossible. So God reveals himself to us because we're here, and the beautiful world that we live in is just a testament to how much he loves us. 
God also reveals himself to us through the Bible. This is the Word of God. This is Him telling us who He is so that we can study it and come to know Him. But just reading the Bible doesn't bring you to this knowledge that Peter has because I know plenty of atheists that know the Bible inside and out. God reveals Himself to us one more way. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says, He's made everything beautiful in its time. He's, He's also, also said etern eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. God has put the notion of eternity into every single person's heart. Everybody knows that there is something more than just this. So what does that mean? What does it mean that there's something more than just this? Paul, in probably his greatest sermon, Paul arguably the greatest preacher that ever lived, delivered a sermon at the Oropagus. And he was talking to a bunch of people that didn't know anything about God. And in this sermon, he says to them, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. God does not need to be found. I hear people say that all the time. Well, I found God. Well, that's good because he wasn't hiding. You don't have to go find God. Jesus says very clearly that he will leave the, the whole herd of sheep to go find one that's lost. Jesus is looking for us. He wants to find us. He comes and gets us. It's not the other way around. We don't have to go seek him out and find him. We just have to listen for his voice. We follow where he leads. But if he's looking for us, why are there so many lost sheep in the world? Why are there so many people that don't know him? And wouldn't it be nice if we all had the same advantages that somebody like Peter did? Peter saw these amazing things that Jesus did, these miraculous things that he did. He heard these teachings that Jesus gave. And that's why in Matthew 16, he was able to say, you're the son of the living God, you're the Messiah. And then right after that, Jesus goes up on a mountaintop and he takes Peter and James and John with him and he, he, his whole being is transfigured into all of his divine glory and Elijah and Moses are there and Peter sees this whole thing and it's a life-changing experience. Then they come down from the mountain and Jesus performs another miraculous healing. He gives several more teachings that are that are just earth shattering some of them directly to peter and you know wouldn't it be great if we all had that advantage where we could know jesus like that and see him and feel him and hear him peter did all of that and he still denied jesus peter had more advantages than any of us could imagine with his faith. But when other people say, who do you say that is? I don't know. I don't know who that is. So what hope do any of us have? If Peter can't be faithful with all of the advantages that he had, what, what hope do any of us have? We live in a world that is very good at distorting who Jesus is. We live in a world that's really good at saying, uh, Jesus, what, he was a great moral teacher. He was, he was a great human moral teacher. Or he was a crazy crackpot that lived in a backwater town in the Roman world. Or this, this is my absolute least favorite one. He was a social justice warrior. No, he wasn't. But we, we, we live in a world that comes up with all of these different explanations for who he is. And 
it's frightening. We don't want to know the truth necessarily because the truth is offensive. We want to be able to do it ourselves. We want to be able to come to this knowledge on our own and we just can't. We want to be able to say that I have overcome the world. I have come against all of these obstacles in faith and I have endured. I am the one that by sheer force of will has come to the point of faith where I have been saved. We love it when people are able to overcome things. Those are the people that we revere in our society. Those are the people that we look up to. People that can do things that other people can't do by sheer force of their own will, by their own discipline and hard work. You, know, you look at the people that we hold up as heroes, people that do these amazing things that not anybody else can do. We, you know, like Edmund Hillary was the first person to climb Mount Everest. And he's a hero. Neil Armstrong was the first person to go to the moon. He's a hero. Despite what TikTok tells you, Neil Armstrong went to the moon. <laughs> Everybody under 25 laughed at that. That's fine. Um, you know, these people that do incredible things that are terrifying, that not... It, I couldn't climb Mount Everest. I mean, you get me up on a ladder and I start getting a little queasy. I sure wouldn't want to go to the moon. You know, we look up to people like that because they have the courage and the ability to do things that nobody else can do. The other kind of people that we revere in our society, these people that are great athletes, great musicians, great artists, things like that. What's the difference between a good athlete and a great athlete? And I'm doing this for shameless, uh, shameless applause. What's the difference between somebody like Patrick Mahomes and any other quarterback? Because he's the best, right? I know that we got some Broncos and Raiders fans here too. Um, honestly, I don't care. I'm a baseball fan. Um, <laughs> Football is a two-week thing at my house. It gets you from the end of the World Series to the start of college basketball. But, um, you know, what's the difference between somebody like Patrick Mahomes and everybody else? There's a lot of natural ability there, sure, but he works hard at it. It doesn't happen on accident. Or a great musician, like somebody like Paul McCartney, he is not a legendary musician just because he accidentally is a talented musician. He had to work very hard at that for a very long time. And we look at people like that and we respect them for the sacrifices that they make and for the obstacles that they've overcome and for the determination that they have. And they say, that guy's great because he did something that nobody else can do. And that's just part of the human condition. We all want to be that. We want somebody to look at us and say, that person's great because they did something that I can't do. And Jesus' disciples are having that same discussion in Matthew 16 or Matthew 17. They're arguing over which one of us is going to be the greatest in heaven. Which one of us, by sheer force of will, is going to be able to overcome the things of the world? And when we get to heaven, everybody's going to look at us and say, boy, isn't that guy great. And they even are bold enough to go ask Jesus. They go to him and say, Jesus, we've been talking. We want you to tell us. Which one of us is going to be the greatest in heaven and why is it me? And Jesus answers them in a way that they probably didn't expect. In Matthew 18, when they're arguing over which one is going to be the greatest in heaven, it says Jesus called a child to him, and he placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does that mean for us? Unless you change and become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't do something to earn your way into heaven. And the reason we can't is because the salvation that he offers us is a gift. It's something that he gives us. The only part that we play in it is to receive it. In Ephesians 2, Paul says, For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. It's a gift. The only thing that you do is receive it, and receive it happily. 
How many of us have a tough time receiving gifts? I know that may sound like a weird thing to say because everybody likes getting stuff, right? But think about the implications of somebody giving you a gift. You know, I have a group of guys from the church that I go eat lunch with on Friday afternoons, and a couple of months ago, one of them, without warning, bought my lunch. And oh, it made me mad. Because he, he paid for it, and he goes, hey, I paid for your lunch. I'm like, oh, now next week I've got to pay for yours. And it became a whole thing where I, I would try to get the check first, he'd try to get the check first, and it was just the two of us, and everybody else was like, why isn't anybody paying for our lunch? But, <laughs> and finally, after a couple of weeks, we're like, okay, we're even truce. No more buying things for anybody. Because then there's an obligation for me to reciprocate. You buy something for me, I got to buy something for you. And then what if you buy me something more expensive than what I bought you? Then you've got the upper hand. Or what if you get me something that I don't like and then I have to pretend that I like it? Or what if you're like my wife and it doesn't matter what you get, I'm going to return it anyway. <laughs> I don't mind sleeping on the couch. It's like camping out and I think it's fun. But that's how adults receive gifts. That's just how we are. It's, it, it's kind of an awkward thing. We don't, some of us at least, we don't like being the center of attention and being given things because it just makes you feel kind of weird. But how does a little kid receive a gift? Like what Jesus is talking about. When you give something to a little kid, how do they receive it? They get excited. And they want to share it with other people. Every Friday, I've got two kids that are still in elementary school, and every Friday they get to get in the treasure box, and they get this little 10-cent piece of junk that means absolutely nothing to them. But as they come running out of the school when I go to pick them up. I'm like, look at this stupid thing that I got out of the treasure box today. What is it? I don't know, but I got it. And, and what do they do? They call everybody. Like, they can't wait to tell me this thing that they got out of the treasure box. And then a lot of times they call my parents. And like, this is a thing that I got today. What is it? I still don't know, but here it is. And then it's so insignificant that by the time Aaron gets home from work, they've lost it. And, but they still want to tell her all about it. Look at, the, I got this thing in the treasure box today. What is it? Oh, I don't know. I lost it, but I got it. And the more important it is, the bigger it is, the more excited they get and the more they want to tell everybody that they know. Like Callie, my youngest daughter, she is just like me and it drives my wife crazy. She wants to talk to everybody that she runs into, especially at Walmart. <laughs> and last week, Aaron was shopping for something. She had Abby with her. They were off somewhere and I had the other two in the toy aisle. And every time we'd walk past something that Callie has at home, she's like, she, she would tell these strangers, I have this, and I got it for Christmas this year. And I also have this, and I got it for my birthday. Like, she just wants to tell everybody. And that, that's what Jesus means when he says, if you will have the faith of a child, if you will receive the kingdom like a child... And realize there's nothing that you can do to earn it and that there's nothing you can do to pay me back. All you've got to do is just accept this wonderful thing that I give you and enjoy it and share it with other people. That's the only thing that I'm asking you to do. But it's, it's a hard thing for us to do. But this message of salvation, this way that Jesus rescued us, he, he gives several different explanations for how it works and one of my favorites in John 10 and it says the Jews who were gathered around him were saying how long are you going to keep us in suspense if you're the Messiah tell us plainly and let me assure you that anytime especially in the gospel of John that people are demanding a sign or an explanation just like what's happening here Jesus has already done that in a crystal clear way. They just didn't like the answer that they got. So Jesus has already explained to them exactly who he is in no uncertain terms. And they still say, well, if you're the Messiah, why don't you just tell us? And he responds to them and said, I did tell you. But you didn't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe because you're not one of my sheep. 
My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We did a thing. My, my girls do a devotion at bedtime every night. And this verse came up a little while ago. And I had Callie, our eight-year-old, hold something in her hand. I can't remember. I think it was like a penny. It was something small that she could wrap her hand all the way around and try to have everybody pry her hand open. And nobody could. Because once you put something in your hand and you make a fist and you hold on to it tight, even I couldn't get her hand open unless I just like really pinched her fingers and applied those pressure points. And I did because I'm a good dad. But if, an eight, if you can't pry an eight-year-old's hand open, you're sure not going to pry Jesus' hand open when he says, I've got you. And you're with me, and nobody can take you away. Nobody can remove you from my hand. He means it. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. I heard that repeated by my four-year-old when she said Jesus is with me and monsters aren't real. Nobody can take me away. Nobody can hurt me. Jesus is with me and the monsters aren't real. I'd like to add a little bit of an addendum to that because the monsters are real. There is an enemy that very much wants to hurt every one of us. But what Jesus is saying here in no uncertain terms is those monsters aren't real to me. Because I'm bigger than them and I've already overcome them. So since they're not real to me, they're not real to you. You don't have to worry about them. Does that mean that nothing bad's ever going to happen in your life? Absolutely not. But nothing, no matter how bad it is, can take you away from me. Nothing can hurt you so bad that you're going to be removed from me. When Peter denied Jesus, he didn't really understand that. Peter was scared of the monsters that were out there. He was scared that they were going to hurt him. When they said, do you know this Jesus person? Were you with him? Who, who is he to you? I don't know him. I don't want to get hurt along with him. I see what they're doing to him. I don't want any part of that. And that's a hard thing for all of us, too. We see the things that happen to Christians, even in this country, and we don't want any part of that. The Peter that wrote First and Second Peter was a completely different person than the one that you read about in the Gospels because Jesus had changed him and made him new. In First Peter 2, Peter says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up into your salvation. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Peter is quoting my favorite psalm. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Test him out. He is asking you, trust me in just a little bit and see if I don't exceed your expectations. Not just meet your expectations, but exceed them. Taste and see. Test just a little bit and see if I don't live up to everything that I tell you. And Peter knew that as good as anybody because Peter got to test and see in a couple of different ways. The one that comes right to the front of my mind is when Jesus was walking on the water and he says, Jesus, if that's you, then call me out so that I can walk on the water with you. And Jesus says, well, come on out. And what does he do? He puts one foot out and he tests to make sure that it's stable. And when he finds out that the water is stable, he goes ahead and comes all the way out. That's what he's inviting us to do. That's that spiritual milk. Just test a little bit, and it's going to grow you into something even better than you can imagine. A couple of weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go to Denver with a group that Logan took. for. It, it's a thing called Lead the Cause. It's kind of a youth retreat, but it's also kind of a training event as well. It's... it's 
not like any of the youth events that I've ever been to. And that's a good thing. But it was a youth event nonetheless. So they, they had worship time when they were there every day, a couple of times a day. They, would have, they had a band that was part of, the, part of the event, and they would come up on stage, and they had loud music with guitars and things like that, and the kids would get really excited. It was a lot of fun. But one of the adults that was there, um, Logan took, I think there were 25 people total that went, kids and adults. And Barry and I were lucky enough to be invited to come and bring a couple of our college kids from the Aspen Roots Ministry. So we got to see it. I really liked the idea of this event, just hearing Logan and some other people talk about it. But then I went to it. And the first thing that I told Aaron when I got home is as soon as our girls are old enough to go to this, they're going and they're not going to have an option. This will change their life. Your kids go to this, it will change their life because I've seen it. But the music would start and for those of you that know him, Chuck Sexton was there as one of the one of the adult sponsors. And as soon as the music would start, Chuck would jump up and he'd run up to the stage. Chuck is the oldest kid in the youth group. And it was funny, the second night that we were there, one of the other adults, uh, it was a guy that was a little bit younger than me, he leans over and he says, when I grow up, I want to be Chuck. <laughs> I said, well, then you're going the wrong direction because Chuck isn't a grown up. <laughs> But he did. He'd get up and he'd run up to the stage and he didn't care who was looking or what was going on. He'd put his hands up in the air and he'd dance around and he knew all the dances that even the kids didn't know. It was pretty incredible to watch. And the kids would get up and they'd follow him because they'd see this example that he had. He didn't care who was watching him. He didn't care what anybody thought of him. He was, gonna, he was dancing and singing to Jesus. And he'd go up there, and then the kids would start following him, and the kids would do things that they didn't think that they could do. Like I saw kids that would sing out loud that don't normally sing out loud. And then maybe they'd put their hands in the air, and then maybe they'd start to dance a little bit because they'd seen this, this other person do it and just not care. And then we did some other things. They, they prayed out loud in front of other people. And they said, I'd never done this before. One of the girls that went with the college group, she said that not only had she never prayed out loud, but she doesn't know that she's ever really prayed before in her life. She prayed with a complete stranger on the street. And she said when she got done, she goes, I didn't know what I was saying. I was just kind of rambling. But she was so excited. It was so cool to see. She's like, I've never done anything like this before. I prayed out loud with a stranger. And that's what they did. And then these kids did some other incredible things. They called their friends and family at home. And they said, I've been praying for you all week. And I know that you don't know Jesus like I do. And I want to explain who Jesus is to you. And they got varying results. There were some really cool stories about kids talking to their friends or their family members. And them changing on the spot some of them didn't but that was okay because they were still so excited because they'd seen somebody like Chuck who wasn't afraid of what the world thought and Chuck led them in all of these things and I know that we've got a lot of people that are here right now that are the same way you're so excited about Jesus that you just don't care what anybody else thinks and that is awesome and I wish I wish we could all be like that you know, and we look around the, at the world that we live in and we say, this world needs a revival. This country needs a revival. Things are going wrong in this country and this country needs Jesus. And that is 100% accurate. And if you think that this country needs a revival, I've got good news and I've got bad news for you. The good news is it's happening. It's happening in ways that we are not only not aware of, but it would blow your mind. The bad news is it's happening without us and it's happening in spite of us. 
It's happening with high school and college kids all over the country, and it is incredible. In the spring, there was a big revival that broke out at Asbury University in Kentucky, and it spread to a bunch of other college campuses, and it was amazing. People were praying, and they were being saved. And you know, the only thing that you saw on social media was people singing, but there was so much more that was going on there. In Los Angeles, California, of all places, there is a huge movement that is still going on with a bunch of high school kids that go out and march in the street and they pray with people and they sing songs and and people are coming to Christ by the thousands it's just like the book of Acts and it is incredible and it's all kids and it's happening in spite of us and why is it happening in spite of us because we're afraid we're afraid of what people are going to think We're afraid of how the world is going to react to us, adults. And it's me just as much as anybody else. We're afraid of what people are going to think. But I'm telling you that there is a larger community that is living in a different kind of fear than the ones that those of us that are afraid to go out and just unashamedly love Jesus in public, they're living in a kind of fear that we don't understand because they don't have the hope that we have as believers. They don't know Jesus. They don't know that there's salvation. They don't know that there's a better way. And do you know why they don't know? Because who's going to tell them? Paul says that in Romans 10. He says, everybody that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we all love that part, don't we? I love it that no matter what I'm going through, I can call on the name of the Lord and I'm going to be saved. But there's more to that. How can they call on the name of one that they haven't believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they've not heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent as it's written? How beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news. Every one of us that is sitting here today, regardless of where your faith is at, you have been commissioned and equipped to share your faith with somebody in your life. And every one of us is afraid to do it, and I can tell you from experience that it doesn't always go well, and sometimes it kind of hurts when it doesn't go well. But I can also tell you from experience, like a lot of other people that are here this morning, that you are never going to regret it. Anytime you put yourself out there and you share your faith with somebody else, and it can be as simple as, I love that show, The Chosen, because there's a line in it that I think just encapsulates everything about our faith. When somebody comes to Mary Magdalene and they ask her what, what is going on with her, and she says, I was one way, and now I'm different, and the thing that changed is him. That is so cool. And that's all that you've got to do. You just tell people, I was one way before, now I'm different, and the only thing that changed is him. He changed me. He made me new, and my life is completely different. And I know that telling you this is maybe going to hurt our relationship, but I don't care because I need you to know it. And that's scary to do, and it sometimes will hurt, but I can promise you that you will never regret it. And any time you share your faith, it is going to not only reach somebody new and possibly plant a seed but when you go out on a limb and do the thing that jesus has called you and equipped you to do it is going to grow your faith and you're going to be able to trust him a little bit more because you have tasted and seen that the lord is good he's not always safe but he's always 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 good everywhere you go everything that you do Jesus is with you. And all of those monsters that you think are out there are not real. Everywhere you go, this is the most important part. He is always with you. We're going to have an invitation right now. If you don't know that the Lord is good, if you've never tasted and seen You have an opportunity to come and pray. If you want to come and be a part of the church by joining in membership, you have an opportunity to do that right now.
This is Jason Lovegrove, and his wife Tiffany's coming back. She went to get one of her kids. They've got four kids, so between them. And uh, anyway, I'll wait for Tiffany. She can't find them. <laughs> you ever been back there? There's like 400 kids, and they're all hanging off the rafters. <laughs> and and here's Tiffany and uh, so they're coming forward wishing to join the church today and I think both of you are going to be reaffirmed in the creek is that right when we go down in October 1st we're going to the creek and we've got several to be baptized and several that were baptized as critters kids and now they're saying hey I found Christ. I want to do it for myself. So I, we will reaffirm their their baptism at that time. I have some questions for you. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Will you continue to grow in the life of grace? Seek God's will in your life. Work as a servant, caring, giving, and sharing with others. Yes, sir. Will you support this church in ministry by giving of your time, talents, service, gifts and prayers great um johnny and nick are up here and uh, johnny of course we hired him to work with our youth he brought them to the church and helped them to know christ again so and here's here's that i owe you a hug God bless you. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, head on to the foyer if you want, and we'll, the people will be back to, out to say hi to you and welcome you to the Christ Community Church. Will you please rise for the benediction? Ty, you want to do it? Will you receive the benediction? Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and sharing with them all that I've given you. And surely I will be with you until the very end of the age. Amen.